Mr. George Yeo, Singapore Summit Conference Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the fourth Singapore Summit. I'm pleased to see so many friends, business leaders, and thought leaders once again in Singapore for this summit, and I'm looking forward to the exchange of perspectives and ideas that we will have over the weekend. Many of us here had hoped that global growth would pick up pace in 2015, after experiencing a few years that had been marked by a modest and uneven recovery across the various economies. Two months ago, however, the IMF trimmed its forecast for global economic growth to 3.3% from the 3.5% forecast made earlier this year. If the latest forecast pans out, global growth will be the weakest since the global financial crisis in 2009. There are, of course, a variety of reasons for the current sentiment on the global economy. The global economic recovery remains uneven across the big economies. The US has recovered well in second quarter 2015, growing by 3.7% on a quarter-on-quarter, -quarter, seasonally adjusted, annualized basis. But the Eurozone economy grew by only 1.3% in the same period. Low commodity prices and an anticipated normalization of US interest rates has also led to increased risk of capital outflows and added pressures on currencies and the various asset markets. Perhaps the biggest concern on most people's mind is the Chinese economy. While its 7% year-on-year growth in second quarter 2015 would have been the envy of advanced countries, there are concerns that China could experience a sharper than expected slowdown. If there is a sharp correction in the real estate market or a significant weakening of consumer or investor sentiments. In addition, last month's correction on China's stock market and the unexpected loosening of the currency pact to bring the renminbi more in line with the market led to a sell-down in global stock markets and heightened volatility in international currency markets. This could also affect global consumer and investor sentiments. Notwithstanding the current challenging macroeconomic conditions, the long-term Asian growth story remains bright. In China, the government has already made some progress in rebalancing its economy from investment and export-driven growth towards consumption-driven growth. And according to the World Bank, China's consumption share of GDP have increased by 2%, 2 percentage points since 2011 to reach 51% in 2014. If we take a long-term view, China's growth potential and its impact on the region would become even more apparent. China is expected to overtake the US to become the largest economy in the world by 2026, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, or the EIU. As private consumption becomes the primary driver of demand in China, the country will also emerge as a leading source of final demand in the global economy. This presents Asian economies with growth opportunities as regional supply chains will reconfigure to cater to the huge Chinese market. Underscoring the immense growth opportunities that lie not only in China, but also in other parts of Asia, the EIU's projection is that by 2050, three of the four largest economies in the world will come from Asia. This will be China, India, and Indonesia. Asia's strong growth potential is not surprising, given that many countries in the region have favorable demographic trends and a fast-expanding middle class. As these economies continue to develop, there will be a large demand for infrastructure investments to close the infrastructure gaps. And the rising Asian middle class will also aspire to higher living standards, thereby generating strong demand for consumer goods. 
regional economic integration will play an important role in unlocking Asia's growth potential by eliminating trade barriers, attracting more investments, and facilitating more competitive markets. Ongoing mega regional initiatives, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, are pathways towards this goal. The TPP, which currently links 12 parties from either side of the Pacific, will integrate one-third of world trade and 40% of the world's GDP. As a high-quality, comprehensive agreement, the TPP will go beyond traditional trade issues and tackle challenges faced by modern businesses. We are currently within striking distance to the completion of the TPP. At the same time, the RCEP will broaden and deepen ASEAN's linkages with its six free trade agreement partners. It is a significant initiative representing over 3 billion people and one-third of the world's GDP. And like the TPP, the RCEP seeks to lower trade barriers, facilitate trade and deepen economic integration. We are encouraged by the good progress made by the ministerial meeting in Kuala Lumpur last month on the RCEP. As a participant in both the TPP and the RCEP, Singapore sees both initiatives as complementary efforts towards achieving regional integration. Asia-wide integration promises income gains reaching 1.9 trillion US dollars or 1.9% of world GDP by 2025. This will have a larger trade creation effect and result in an Asia-Pacific region that is more attractive and competitive. This is why the architectures of both the TPP and RCEP are designed to be open and inclusive, to serve as mutually reinforcing pathways towards the goal of an Asia-Pacific-wide free trade agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, Asia's long-term prospects continue to remain bright and efforts to integrate the region will help Asia as well as the global economy realise the growth potential and prosper. You have many interesting sessions ahead of you tomorrow on the growth opportunities, the risks and game-changing businesses. I'm confident that they will be filled with fruitful and lively discourse. We are also all looking forward to the keynote address later this, this evening by His Excellency Arun Jesli, Minister for Finance, Corporate Affairs and Information and Broadcasting of India. So enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much.